بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا من سيئات أعمالنا من يحده الله فلا مضل له ومن يدلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله أما بعد فإن أصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الحدي حدي محمد صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار After praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and sending immense greetings and salutations upon the final Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam, we come to the end of our journey, the journey of the human being, the journey of the soul, the journey that every single individual needs to make or to take. As we find inside the Qur'an, كُلُّ نَفْسٍ دَاعِكَةُ الْمَوْتِ Every single soul will taste death which has been mentioned in three separate locations inside the Qur'an. <coughs> Firstly, inside Surah Ali Imran, from verse 180 or so. Then again, in Surah Al-Anbiya. Then again, in Surah Al-Ankabut, the 29th chapter of the Qur'an. And that's all of us have to taste the sweetness or the bitterness of death and that return journey back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then in that return, or that journey back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we either have to face the elements or the return back into paradise because that is the original abode of the human being. Because we know that living on this dunya, وَلَكُمْ فِي الْأَرْضِ مُسْتَقَرٌ وَمَتَاعٌ إِلَى حِينٌ You're only here for a short span of time and we have to return back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The real abode is the hereafter for the individual. We were living in paradise for our father, Adam alayhi salam was residing in paradise and then because of that that sin or that mistake that we find he was expelled from paradise and brought down upon this earth thus the human being the soul yearns to return back to the akhirah to return back to the real home which is paradise but unfortunately for some of us we may not go back to paradise we may go back to the opposite and that's the whole theme of opposites that you find is a deep theme to ponder and to reflect upon. A sunnah al kawniyah, the sunnah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala around the universe around us, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has placed certain elements, whether it be concepts of senses and feelings that you find of being happy or sad, cold and warm, the sun and the moon, the land, the oceans, etc. That we find it's all this concept of zawjain, pairs, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created everything in pairs. The animal kingdom, the plant kingdom, the human race, male and female. وَمِن كُلِّ شَيْءٍ خَلَقْنَا زَوْجَيْنِ لَعَلَّكُمْ تَذَكَّرُونَ Place everything in pairs that you may reflect upon that. And even manhaj al-Qur'an, the methodology of the Qur'an that you find, is one of following in a theme of pairs. The Qur'an is بَيْنَ الْوَعْدِ وَالْوَعِيدِ Between strong admonition, warning and a promise of felicity and bliss and goodness. The Qur'an is بَيْنَ al-Bashir وَنَذِيرِ Between giving you glad tidings and warning you. The Qur'an is بَيْنَ al-Targhib وَتَرْهِيب The Qur'an is between giving you encouragement and likewise discouraging you from certain actions. So that's the role of the Qur'an. Likewise the role of the Prophet Muhammad was to come with that same pattern, that same methodology that we sent you as a witness, as a testimony upon mankind. As we find inside the Qur'an, Ya Yuhal Nabiyu inna arsalnaka shahidan wa mubashiram wa nadheera. We sent you as a witness. And likewise, one who's giving the bushra, the glad tidings, and one who is warning in humanity as well. Other locations that we find inside the Qur'an, Wa ma arsalnaka illa kafata lil nasi bashiran wa nadheera. Wa lakinna akthara nasi la ya'lamun. We did not send you except for as a warner to warn the people and likewise to give them the glad tidings. So that becomes the sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad as well. And thus the akhirah becomes that same pattern as well. Just like in the dunya, as-sura' bayn al-kufri wal-iman, the battle between disbelief and iman, between good and evil, even though there has to be a distinction, قُلْ لَا يَسْتَوِ الْخَبِيثُ وَالطَّيِّبُ وَلَوْ أَعْجَبَكَ كَثْرَةُ الْخَبِيثُ 
good things are not going to be like the impure things. It's going to be a distinction. And likewise, kufr is not going to be like iman. But ulama write that these opposites exist because through opposite you recognize the truth. If there was no kufr on the planet, you would not recognize true iman and the halawat al-iman. If there wasn't disbelievers, you wouldn't really appreciate the concept of being a mu'min, a believer. So that's whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala creates is there. Hikmatullahi baligha. That means wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That even the creation of the devil of shaitan of Iblis or Lucifer that we find, there's a reason that he's been created to see which of us are going to follow the traps and the snares of the devil and those of us who are going to abstain and try to follow that path towards paradise. So that becomes the two opposites inside the Akhirah. It becomes أَمَّا شَقِيٌ أَوْ سَعِيدٌ فَرِيقٌ فِي الْجَنَّةِ وَفَرِيقٌ فِي النَّارِ That's how simple it is. The Quran describes it. A group that will be inside hellfire and a group that will be inside paradise. There will be a wretched group and there will be a rejoicing group. So as Muslims, we need to begin to think and weigh up that which group are we trying to follow? What is our end destination going to be? And that's the Quran mentioned that talking about the first time it mentions the concept of mawt. وَإِنَّمَا تُوَفَّوْنَ أُجُورَكُمْ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ فَمَنْ زُحْزِحَ عَنِ النَّارِ وَأُدْخِلَ الْجَنَّةَ فَقَدْ فَاسْتِ وَمَا الْحَيَاةُ الدُّنْيَا إِلَّا مَتَاعُ الْغُرُورِ Whoever on that day of judgment you find, that on the day of judgment you'll be brought forth to accountability the actions that you've done in this world. Full reward, full recompense will be given to you. And whoever is saved from the hellfire and thrown into paradise, فَقَدْ فَاسْتِ that is the most successful individual. وَمَا الْحَيَاةُ الدُّنْيَا إِلَّا مَتَاءُ الْغُرُورِ What is this world except for a great big deception? That's what this world is. The world has been created as a form of deception. To see whether you're going to live up to the test. And that's you find in the hadith in the Sahih of Imam Muslim. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created paradise. Jibreel alayhi salam when he saw paradise. Saw the glitter, the glamour, the beauty. So whoever sees it just want to dive straight into paradise. And whoever sees Jahannam want to abstain from Jahannam. And thus Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that cover paradise with obstacles and cover Jahannam with temptations. Huffatil Jannatu bil makarih wa huffatil naru bil shahawat. So paradise is covered with obstacles and hellfire is covered with temptations. Every single path of temptation, any action of temptation leads you towards the path of Jahannam. Any temptation, any sin, any vice will eventually lead you to travel the path of the journey towards Jahannam. And likewise, any goodness, path of bir or khair leads you towards paradise. But obviously there's going to be obstacles. Imam al we explained this hadith in the sharh of the Sahih of Imam Muslim. What is the meaning that paradise is surrounded by obstacles? Because many of us think we're just going to stroll into paradise. There's no struggle. There's no devotion. There's no commitment. And the Quran is replete with so many ayat. Those who believe and do righteous actions. This is the belief of Ahl Sunnah. Iman and righteous actions. It's not just a concept that I believe. As some of us Muslims may think that as long as you just say I believe. It's far deeper than that. Real belief of Ahl Sunnah is that that belief begins to profess, begin to be shown, begins to be implemented, that you're trying to live a life of a believer. That's the other concept of faith that you find around us, that I'm a Christian, or I'm a Jew, or whatever it may be. It's a personal relationship. That's what some Muslims are falling into, that Islam is a personal relationship. It's not a personal relationship. Inside your heart, when you're standing in prayer, it's a personal relationship. But coming to the masjid is a testimony of faith. Whoever visits the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala frequently testify that person has iman. Man salla bardain dakhala jannah. Whoever offers the two cold prayers enters paradise. The two cold prayers being salatul fajr and salatul isha. Read through all the hadith in great detail. What do you find? Wajibat lahu jannah. Adman lahu fil jannah. Lahu al jannah. Ghurisat lahu fil jannah. Lahu fil jannah. Person will have in paradise, will be given in paradise, promised in paradise, planted in paradise, I guarantee for him in paradise. Study all those hadith. And all of them, what do you find? Action. All of them you find action. Study them in great detail. All of them are linked that you do this, paradise. You do this, you get paradise. Control what's between your two jaws and between your two legs. Adman lahu. 
I guarantee for him a place in paradise. Words of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Even if you dissect this hadith in today's language and understand it, you find the average Muslim youth can't control his private parts. The average Muslim who even claims to know about, Mus about Islam can't control his tongue. Ghiba, min al kabair, backbiting brothers isn't a minor sin. Min al kabair amongst the major sins, amongst the major sins, and some of us take it something trivial. Qila wa qal, this and that, and speak ill about people. That's in the Muslim world. You know, there's a great bigger politics that exists in the Muslim world. Obviously, they can't disclose in this arena at this stage, but it exists. And the other half of the Muslim globe that you find, the Muslim youth, can't control themselves. So he was able to control that small amount of flesh in both areas, guaranteed paradise. Action, life of perseverance, of control, of commitment. Thus, Imam Nawi highlighting that those obstacles that surround paradise are what? Firstly, he highlights ijtihad fil ibadat, striving in actions of obedience. The Fajr prayer, the five daily prayers, Salat al Isha, coming to Jum'ah, fasting Ramadan, performing of Hajj. How many Muslims do we find <coughs> at this stage? Talking about great big causes, etc. Come to Salat al Fajr, simple question, ask them. Muslims get so excited, tahriq al isba, fit tashahud, how fast to move the finger in tashahud. How to do raful yadain, how to say that mean khalf al imam. Wallahi, these are the only things we've been stigmatized with. That's the only thing that we know. Is that all the da'wah of the sunnah is? Is that all that we know? Sallu kama ra'itumuni wa salli da hadith in Bukhari, or kama qal sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Praise, you see me praying. That becomes a mi'ya, that becomes a symbol. That's the only symbol that we know. That as long as you do these certain actions, you're qualified as a person of sunnah. Kalla. Total misunderstanding. You make a critique of those people, but those elderly, elderly individuals come to Salat al-Fajr, you find them there. You find them there, and where are those young youth who are talking about the return of Islam, the renaissance of Islam, the resurgence of Islam? Salat al-Fajr, where do you find them? Sleeping in their beds. That's a reality. Great dreams, but can't even stroll out of their bed and come to the masjid. And they talk about big, big achievements. That's how you weigh, weigh up the state of the Muslim Ummah. Travel through the Muslim Ummah, come into Salat al-Fajr, and you'll see what the state of the Muslim Ummah is, sleeping. That's the real state of the Muslim Ummah, stagnation. The Muslim Ummah revolves around spirituality. Remember that in great detail. Obviously there's other elements that we need, but spirituality is the main cause. We don't fight with weaponry, or power, or force. That's just a side element. The real power and the force of the believer is his devotion towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if people are not even punctual in the five daily prayers and they're talking about high obstacles or high achievements, they misunderstood Islam. Because even in the realms inside Surah Nisa, even the state of jihad that you find, the Quran still says to the believers that one group should be leading and one group should be standing behind it and they swap positions. This is a station of fighting the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And here we find trivial things. I'm moving from this location to that location, combine my prayers, skip my prayers, shorten my prayers, going to university, going here, going there. The first thing in the hadith Tabrani, awwal ma yuhasibu naf al-abdu yawm al-qiyamah, the first thing the abdu will be asked about the day of judgment is his prayer. Khalas. Not about other things. That's the first thing all of us will be asked about. If that has been rectified, everything else will become successful. Sifatul Mu'mineen, characteristic of the believers, inside Surah Al-Mu'mineen, the 23rd chapter of the Quran. Qad aflaha al-mu'mineen, alladheena hum fi salatihim khashi'oon. Simple. That's the characteristics of the believers. Many times inside the Qur'an, those who guard their prayers, preserve their prayers, worried about their prayers, guard your prayers. حَافِذُوا لَلصَّلَوَاتِ وَالصَّلَاتِ الْوُسْطَى وَقُومُوا لِلَّهِ قَانِتِينَ Guard your prayers, and especially the middle prayer. قَوْلُ الرَّاجِحُ وَالصَّلَاتُ الْعَسَقِ Guard the middle prayer. In the hadith we find, whoever misses the middle prayer, the late afternoon prayer, is that they lost their whole, their wealth, all of their family. But we find it trivial. And we talk about other elements. That's the first path to paradise. To be worried about that. Secondly, Imam Nawi mentions, Qadmul Ghayf, to swallow one's anger. How many Muslims do you find are able to swallow their anger? Whoever debates with a person, whoever goes into an argument with a person, and you know that you are correct, you know that you're correct, but you refuse to carry an argument with a person, you restrain yourself, that person is guaranteed a place in paradise, a house in paradise. But when we're debating with someone, we just have to make sure we get the message across. You've just missed your house in paradise. You've missed it. 
You've missed it. And sometimes you could be debating and you are wrong. But you want to carry on debating just to send home the message. So swallowing one's anger is a characteristic of a powerful person to go into paradise. Thirdly, al-afu, pardoning people. That's something we've forgotten from the sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad To overlook people's mistakes, to pardon them, not to question them about it. Anas ibn Malik narrates, Qadamtu Nabiya sallallahu alayhi wa sallam I served him for 10 years. 10 years. In that 10 year period, he never said to me, why do you do that? Why didn't you do it like that? Why don't you do it like this? Tasawwaru hadha. Ashra sinin. 10 years. We don't have sabr with a person for 10 minutes. For 10 minutes we don't have sabr with a person. He had 10 years. Or being in the suhbah, the companionship, the person, he never saw anything. Never questioning about what he done. Could have been doing it wrong. No problem. Forgiveness to pardon humanity. Something we forgive him. Forgotten. That is a path to paradise. Fourthly, we find a sabr and shahwa. To control yourself from temptations which are presented in front of you. Any path of temptation that comes in front of you, have sabr, patience to not fall into temptations. As we mentioned, temptations are a path that leads you towards Jahannam. So this is all the path that a person needs to begin to think upon. That in this journey, upon this world, that I need to begin to follow the path of the people of paradise. If I want to become amongst the people of paradise, or to have the final abode of entering into paradise. And as we know that the Quran, as we began, has that fine balance. That ayat which talked about the rahmah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Katab Rabbukum ala nafsih rahma. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has written it upon himself, he's going to be merciful. A lot of Muslims they sway towards that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is ghafoor rahim. No problem, I've done this, I've done that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive me. But look at the tawazun. At the same time, you find many of those ayat which talk about the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wa huwa shadidu al iqab. He's surveying punishment. Stern and harsh. Those ayat, then we begin to miss them. Ayatul Zajr, Ayatul Adab, verses of punishment, verses of warning, severe warning. So we need to balance it out. Not just go towards the compassionate side and then begin to become neglectful of our actions. So that's why we need to find that balance, focusing upon both ayat. That's the Prophet Muhammad mentioned. If you knew what I knew, la dahitum qalila wa la bakaytum kathira. If you knew what I knew, you would laugh seldom. You would hardly ever laugh and you'd weep often. Because remember, the Prophet <coughs> visualized both paradise and he visualized the hellfire. He made that journey through them. And even whilst he was on the earth, paradise exposed him and he went forward to grab a bunch of grapes or the fruit that was presented in front of him. In this dunya was shown to him. Like what you find the Isra, the night journey that he made. And then he took a step back. And the companions asked him, You've done a strange action today. So the reason I went forward is because I wanted to grab some of the fruit of paradise presented to me right in front of me. And when I went back, a strand of fire was being presented in front of me, so I went back trying to avoid the fire. So he mentioned that I've got that certainty about the return of paradise and the punishment. And as you find, وَاسْتَقِمْ kama umir, The verses of Surah Hud that we find in the 11th chapter of the Quran. And even you read the signs of this surah, and he's mentioned, شَيِّبَتْنِ هُودٌ وَأَخَوَاتُهَا the Surah 11, Surah and other the sister Surahs you find, has made my hair go grey. Study these Surahs, what do you find inside them? Talk about ayat of adab, of punishment, return to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Imam Suyut in his tafsir al durr al-Manthur highlights, after this verse came down, وَاسْتَقِمْ كَمَا أُمِرْ Remain steadfast as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is commanding you to do so. فَمَا رُؤِيَ الضَّاحِكًا صَلَّى اللَّهُ وَسَلَّمْ Was never seen laughing in his life ever again. Never seen laughing again. When the command came to remain steadfast. And when the Prophet Muhammad would laugh, he would just smile or very rarely would open his mouth. Today we laugh with our mouths fully open like donkeys. That's what we do, laugh like donkeys, like animals. Because life for many of us has become enjoyment. For many of us Muslims, that's all that life is about. As long as I can enjoy myself and then somehow I just make some form of intercession. You know, the concept of intercession exists inside the Sharia. But it's quite restricted and quite unique. It's not as many of us think that I say, Ya Rasulullah, I'm going to stroll into paradise. That's nothing but Catholicism. That's what Catholics believe. 
That's what Christians believe. That Saint Michael, Saint Peter, Saint Andrew, all these people, they intercede for me. These are peers, that's what they are. They make me get into paradise. That's Catholicism. May sound harsh, and that is the reality of what many Muslims believe today as well, unfortunately. That this ask any non-Muslim to become a Muslim, ask them. They left that life. They left Catholicism because they don't want to go through these intermediaries. We as Muslims follow exactly the same pattern. That this so-and-so individual is my ticket to paradise. You think I may be exaggerating? There's people out there who flamboyantly, openly say, give me £10,000, I guarantee you a place in paradise. Openly say, they don't even conceal it anymore. They openly say, you give me money, I guarantee you a place in paradise. Well, why don't you firstly guarantee your own place in paradise? Guarantee your own place in paradise before you try to guarantee someone else a place in paradise. And on the day of judgment, we'll see where your place is inside paradise. If it really is inside paradise. But many of us Muslims want to follow that path. That my priority, <coughs> No individual carries the burden of another individual. That's Christianity once again. Christ died for our sins. The Prophet Muhammad died for our sins. He died for our sins. He's going to intercede for me. I'm a Muslim, full stop. I don't need to live a life of action. I don't need to do anything. He died for my sins. He's going to intercede for me. Does that make sense? You do whatever you want to do in your life. Commit all types of haram actions in your life. And just because I have a Muslim name, I'm in the ummah of the Prophet Muhammad. He's going to intercede for me. I'm going to paradise. Is that your shallow understanding of Islam? So we are just, all of us, are wasting our time of banging our heads down on the floor. That's what we're doing, we're wasting our time. That's what the aqidah, that's what the belief teaches us. You're wasting your time, brothers. Because you're not on the path to paradise. This praying, this fasting, all this is waste of time. You may as well live a life of haram, and the Prophet will just intercede for you, finish, and you go into paradise. That's what this aqidah is. That's what this belief is. The path to paradise is a path of struggle. The commodity of Allah subhanahu wa is expensive. That expensive commodity is paradise. One has to struggle for paradise. One wants to go back into paradise and eat the food, the drink, the clothing. Study the ahadith in great detail once again. Whoever, whichever man wears silk in this world, will not wear the silk of the akhirah. Whatever man wears gold in this world, will not wear gold inside the akhirah. Whoever drinks the wine of this world will not drink the wine of the akhirah. Abstinence. That's what it is teaching us, abstinence. You want the pure things inside the akhirah, you have to abstain from inside this dunya. But the pure things inside the akhirah is going to be sharab and tahura. A pure wine, a pure drink. Allah subhanahu wa lays out the parable of the four different types of rivers that will be there. The pure water, the pure honey, the pure milk, the pure wine. But even the Prophet took the natural fitra. When from paradise the pure wine and the milk was offered to him, he picked up the goblet of milk, the natural fitra. Lest someone may come in his dunya and say, the Prophet, whilst he was here, it was presented to him, he took the chandelier of wine, so he's allowed to drink wine. But he took the pure substance. So inside the akhirah, the food that you find inside the akhirah, that we place there, given to the believers, وَتُوبِهِ مُتَشَابِهَا you're going to be given those things that share the same names of this dunya. But inside the akhirah, it changes entity, it changes form, changes into something else. Every time you bite the apple, the tufah, what it may be towards our language, our understanding, change color, change taste, throw the core, and what happens? Returns back to the apple and goes back to the tree. You eat the meat, lahman tariya, fresh tender meat, pure meat. Tastes different, tastes beautiful every occasion. All given to people inside paradise. Because of the actions that they used to do, they'll be given that reward inside the akhirah towards these individuals. And thus you find, أَعْدَدْتُ لِعْبَادِيَ الصَّالِحِينَ مَا لَا عَيْنٌ رَأَتْ وَلَا أُذْنٌ سَمِعَتْ وَلَا خَطَرَ عَلَى قَلْبِ بَشَرٌ I have prepared for my servants what no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, and the feeling and perception not come in the heart of any human being. What is that preparation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Compare the preparation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even though there is no comparison, over what we've been asked to do. What have we been asked to do in reality in this world? 
a few simple basic elementary actions that's what we've been asked to do and look at what the reward is the reward is immense the reward is unbelievable what the person is given in return for the meagerly action that we do is multiplied many times over when we're given so much but we don't seem to understand that we're thinking that Allah is asking too much from us Allah has given us so many opportunities to get into paradise. So many times, so many moments, so many days of reflection, even the hardship that you find is really a mercy. It's just that it may seem the wahir is adab, but the internal is rahmah, is compassion, because it may be trying to bring you closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, make you begin to reflect. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants that opportunity for every single individual to earn their way into paradise. But you become so arrogant, so turning away from that path that you want to miss that opportunity. You want to miss the bliss. The hadith in Sahih Muslim that we find. That the believer who lived that life of enjoying 50, 60 years of doing whatever haram they wanted to do. One small dip inside Jahannam. Hal ra'ita na'iman qat? Hal marra bika ni'matul qat? Did you ever see anything good in your life? Did you have any blessings in your life? You know this person would say, no. The believer living a life of not much, not having much of this dunya, whatever it may be, hardship, calamity, oppression, one small dip in paradise. Hal ra'ayta bu'san qat? Hal marra bika shiddatun qat? Did you ever see any adversity? Did any hardship come upon you? One small dip in paradise. And he, the believer will say, no. A small whip in paradise. You know, a whip you lash an animal with, one strand of that is better than the dunya and whatever it contains. Two rakah, two units of prayer before Salat al-Subh, before Salat al-Fajr. That two sunnah that you find. You know, always we go into a technical debate. Is it recommended? Is it not recommended? If it's a sunnah, I'm going to do it. If it's not, I'm going to leave it alive. That's why we fall into this trap. Even people reviving the sunnah as well. If it's only a sunnah, no problem. Go and understand if you want to be in a journey towards paradise. Two sunnahs before paradise, uh, two sunnahs before Salat al Fajr, Khairun mina dunya wa ma fiha. Full stop. Don't take me into a technical discussion. Don't take me into a technical path. That's what will become always technical. The hadith is quite clear. Those two units of prayer is better than the dunya and whatever it contains. So you don't care what someone comes and says to you, well, it's only sunnah and shafi'i fiqh is this, humbly fiqh is this, or if you walked in and this, that, and the other. You're, you're on the path to paradise. You're not going to get involved in this. That's the one thing that's destroyed that shab. That's one thing that destroyed that shabab that you find even the revival of Sahbat al Islamia. What they, what's the biggest aib they say upon us? You don't even pray any sunnah. You said that you're going to go and pray them at home, outside, you're standing for another hour, you come back and it's asr time. So where's sunnah? where did you pray your sunnah? Whoever prays 12... Sunnans in the day, 12 sunnans in the day, 2 before Fajr, 4 before Dhuhr, 2 after Dhuhr, 2 after Maghrib, 2 after Salat al-Isha. What's for that individual? What's for that individual? A house in paradise. Fi ikhtilaf now? What do our shabab do? Read their prayer, walk out, finish. We know they don't go and pray their sunnah inside the home. Or they're reviving that sunnah. But you know why? Because the vision towards paradise is weak. It's an academic vision. It's a vision of academia, of rhetoric, of speech. The real vision towards akhirah, that person knows the academic side, but is traveling a journey that these things are not going to distract me. Monday and Thursday, gates of paradise are swung open. I want to fast on those days. I want to fast on those days. Is the way of the Prophet Muhammad. But then once again, it's only Sunnah. Many times I always question, it's only Sunnah. Or people go into the concept, it's only a minor sin. It's only a Sahira, it's only a minor sin. Read the works of the Fuqaha. Al Istimrar bisagair tusbih min al kabair. Continuous habitual practice of a minor sin becomes a major sin. If you continuously do it, it becomes a major sin. And it's another thing that destroyed many people. It's only a minor sin. Talking to a girl, it's not, it's not haram. It's only a minor sin, so I talk to a girl. 
what eventually happens to most people who talk to girls? As the Arab Sha'i, the poet, he wrote, Awwal al-ibtisam, or awwal al-nadhar, first at glance, thumma ibtisam, thumma dahik, first a glance, then the smile, then the laugh, then the contact, then the numbers, then the meeting, and then you know what the rest of the story is. So what does it begin from, isn't it? What did it begin from? That's what you find, that the glance is the poison arrow of the devil. It goes bang straight into your heart. So what does the Quran say? وَلَا تَقْرَبُوا الزِّنَا إِنَّهُ كَانَ فَاحِشَةً وَسَاءَ سَبِيلًا وَلَا تَقْرَبُوا الزِّنَا Quran doesn't say وَلَا تَفْعَلُوا الزِّنَا Quran doesn't say don't commit zina. It said وَلَا تَقْرَبُوا الزِّنَا Don't go near zina. And you're trying to classify it as a minor sin. Hadith in Muslim الْعَيْنُ تَزْنِي The eye commits zina. And the zina of the eye is the looking. The ears commit zina. The mouth commits zina. The hand commits zina. And then the private parts testify to that complete zina. It all begins from a small thing, doesn't it? And it becomes something great big. So we shouldn't fall into the trap to think, oh, it's only something minor. Because remember also, likewise, in the path towards paradise, whoever does an atom's weight of good will see it. And whoever does an atom's weight of evil will see it. That small atom's weight of good may be that small action that you need to just somehow drift into paradise. لا تحقرن من المعروف شيئا Don't despise any small action, any good action. You have any opportunity to do good action, do it with sincerity because that may be that one small action that just weighs your scale and just swings you into paradise. Look at study the ahadith who talk about the branches of faith. The highest branch of faith is what? قول لا إله إلا الله the lowest is what? إِمَاتَةُ الْأَذَى عَنِ الطَّرِيقِ To remove a harmful obstacle away from the street. It's a branch of Iman. To just remove something with the correct intention. <coughs> remove something like, remove the stone, remove an obstacle that's blocking a Muslim path, a non-Muslim path. That's a sign of Iman. That small action, that sincerity, could lead you into paradise. But obviously we don't want to think like that, do we? We're somehow thinking of bigger things. And these smaller things just drift by us. And likewise, that small evil action, that one small evil action could just lead you towards Jahannam. And if you go and study Kitab al-Jannah wa Sifatul Na'imiyah inside the Sahih of Imam Muslim, towards the end that you find, beautiful ahadith talking about the bliss, the blessings in paradise, the shade of the tree, the size of the tree, how if a swift rider will ride underneath the tree, a hundred years of riding swiftly, he still can't cross the shade. Still cannot cross the shade. Is the size of a tree inside paradise. Even the last man, or the least rewardful individual, the man in paradise, study what the reward will be given to him. You know, because the nature of the human being is always to ask for more and more. So he's going to say to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, bring me close to this one tree. Allah subhanahu wa is going to say that, you know, you're going to ask for something else. See, I'm not going to ask for anything else. Comes to that one tree, after a short while, it's going to say, Ya Rab, let me come to that next tree. Did you not say you're not going to ask for something else? It's going to come to the next tree. Say, I want to go to the next tree. I can hear here now the sounds of the people of paradise. Bring me next to the gates of paradise. And then it's going to say eventually, let me go into paradise. But you said you didn't want something else. Request what you want. Whatever you want and you desire inside your heart. وَمِثْلُهُ 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 Ten times over. Are you trying to make a mockery out of me, Ya Rabbi? Are you making a joke out of me? Last man in paradise. Ten times the word and whatever it contains and more given to this individual. Imagine that. Didn't do much in this world possibly. But look at the immense reward given inside the Akhirah for that individual. The lush pavilions. The palaces that you find, place for the individual. You can see the, the tent, study the ahadith, Kitabul Jannah, Sifatul Na'imiha. The ground, the marble, the sand, everything is so unique, so special, that's there. But we're losing that conviction. The Quran begins with, Alladina yu'minuna bil ghayb. Believers are those who believe in the unseen. So the more murky your vision of the unseen is, the more murky your actions will become. The more stronger your vision is towards the Akhirah and towards the unseen, the more stronger your actions will become. 
Just like you find if you study the science of a horse that's running in a race, you find why do you think it wears those blind spots or those folds to cover the side of its eyes? Because the minute or the second, the minute of a second it glances to the horse next to it, it will lose that simple inch. And that's the parable of a believer. <coughs> the believer just needs to keep focus straight towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. mustaqiman it's a long path to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you need to remain steadfast and committed in that path. Yes, at times, as we mentioned, the hadith is makari, or the explanation by Imam Nawi is difficult, it's obstacle. This is difficult to come out in the morning. But that is the test of Iman. It's difficult to profess your faith. That is the test of Iman. Alif la mima hasib al nas wa yutraku wa yakulu amanna wa hum la yuftanun. Do you think you're just going to say, I believe, and you're not going to be tested? We did test those people before you to find out those individuals who are the liars and those who are the truthful. <coughs> so that's going to be part of Islam. You become a Muslim, there's going to be a struggle. Every single human being goes through a struggle in their life. Non-Muslims go through struggles, don't they? Work commitments, life commitments, family commitments. It's all there. So how come they can begin to override and, and live up to the struggles that they go through? And when it comes to our struggle, or our devotion, we begin to diminish and wither away. So to set right that journey back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, one needs to focus upon the heart. And at the same time, be fearful. Ya yuladhina amanu, qu anfusakum wa ahlikum nara. Save yourselves and save your family members from the fire, whose fuel is men and stones. Stern angels standing over there, guarding that, the fire. Some people will be thrown inside that fire. A stern punishment that you find. If you begin to study the realm of Jahannam that you find. Various names inside the Quran. Jahim, Saqr. Even Saqr that you find. Ma salakakum fi Saqr. What made you end up going into Jahannam inside Saqr? Qalu lam naku min al musalleen. We never used to pray. We never used to pray. That is a path that leads you to Jahannam. Wa lam naku nut'imu al miskin. We never used to feed the poor. Wa kunna nukadibu bi yawmidin. Wa kunna nakhudu al khaidin. We used to be wasting our time with the people wasting their time. We used to reject the, the deen. And we used to, until what? Hatta atan al yaqeen. Until the certainty came to us, death came to us. It's too late now. Now a person is going to be dragged on their way, heading towards the hellfire. And we know that the hellfire has been heated <coughs> for a thousand years and heated again till eventually the hellfire has become black. You know, people, you know, sometimes Muslims just say, you know, they say, I'm funny thing, Sheikh, you know. You know, I'll do a few things and I'll burn for a short while in Jahannam and then I'll stroll into paradise. Go home to British Gas and switch it on and put your hand there for more than a minute. Isn't it? That's what you're trying to say. You're trying to play games, aren't you? That I'll burn for a short while and I'll make it into, then I'll go into paradise. Then go and burn yourself there for a short while. And you think you can take the heat of the Akhirah? So every single Muslim is finding the swiftest way to get into paradise. To avoid that punishment, study the ayat inside the Quran. Every time we burn them, we roast their skins and bring about a new skin. Skin specialists have proven that what, what you feel the pain is your skin carries the pain, the senses of feeling the pain. And that's every time the skin is burnt, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala places a new skin and burns you again. Tell innaha lava. Another name of Jahannam that you find, lava. Lava means that the fire goes all the way deep down into your skull. La tubqi wa la tadhar. Does not let anyone get away. Has no remorse for any individual. As you find that is the punishment. That when once a person is thrown inside Jahannam, that a person will be inside the pillars that you find. If you study the Tafsir of Surah Al-Humazah that you find, the small surah that we read, read on a daily basis, inshallah, you find, look and study those ayat. That ulama, Imam Ibn Kathir and Ibn Rajul al mentions talk about the concept of Jahannam. That when a person is thrown inside Jahannam, that you find that bolts are placed. Places like Jahannam, and bolts are placed. Vaults are placed. Mufassirun highlight a long vault. A long pole is placed. Because if it's a short bolt, it will burn quickly. But a long bolt keeps the doors of Jahannam sealed and you're burning inside. The heat is more excessive for the individual. Is the torture inside there to the individuals when they're placed inside Jahannam. That's you find a mass portion of the world, a mass portion of the human race are travelling on their way towards Jahannam. And thus they want everyone to travel along with them. That's the human nature. When a person, even when they're doing wrong, 
psychologically, they want people to join them, to make them feel good. <coughs> that's what they want. So that's this society, and, and, and in general, whatever, even Muslim society as well, who are going towards a path of evil and wrong, they want everyone to join them, to feel exactly the same. That's what they I mean. Sometimes these foolish individuals, even this heavy metal band, if you study their path of the devil, what they belong to, they even you know, talk about that we're going to have a big party in Jahannam. That's their foolishness. That even when we go to hell, we'll have a big party in hell as well. But that's their, you know, their understanding that it may be just some walk through hell, it may be, or something easy. But a Muslim has that yaqeen that certainly begins to think. That's what Abdullah Mas'ud he mentioned that, you know, the munafiq, the hypocrite, the person who doesn't really care much about their deen. When they commit a sin or something happens, they see it like a fly on the tip of their nose, they'll brush it aside. A mal-mu'min, the believer, when they do something, sees it like a mountain on top of their head about to collapse upon them. Reflects upon it. You know, a person gets worried. That's why Ibn Qayyim al-Jawziyah, he highlights some strange words at times classified as Tabib al-Qalb, the doctor of the heart. The most famous student of Ibn Taymiyyah, rahmatullahi alayhi. If you read his works about Tazkiyah, you, you marvel at his words at times. He writes some strange words. رُبَّ مَعْصِيَةٍ تَجُرُّكَ إِلَى الطَّاعَةٍ وَرُبَّ طَاعَةٍ يَجُرُّكَ إِلَى مَعْصِيَةٍ Perhaps disobedience can take you to obedience. And perhaps obedience can take you to disobedience. The first part is quite clear. That when the person feels remorseful for their sins, as you find the hadith in Sunnah of Ibn Majah, in the nadam huwa tawbah. When you feel regret, that is tawbah. You feel that inside your heart that this is the wrong path. You know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sometimes right deep down inside your place inside your heart. No matter what takes place around you, is the one who takes you out of the realms of the darkness and brings you to the light. Just because you may see a brother on the street in a bad state, doing haram, doing fawahish, doing muharramat, in your heart, you should be thanking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ya Rabbi, thank you that I'm not on that path. There's no need to curse and revile him. Because if that comes into your heart and you become arrogant, then that arrogance takes you towards Jahannam. And remember what led Iblis into Jahannam. What led him to Jahannam was his pride and his arrogance. The first sin, the first sin that was committed in the heavens is pride, is arrogance. Al-Kibr. ana khayru minhu khalaqtani min nar wa khalaqtum min teen. I am better than him. Created me from fire, created him from clay. Why should I bow down to Adam? Abba was takbara wa kana minal kafirin. Refused, became arrogant, and became amongst the disbelievers. Ya Ikhwan, we're just your brothers. That's what we are. We are the brothers together carrying on the same journey. That's what you said, the hadith of Safina, the hadith of the ship. We're all traveling in one great big ship. Some of us is the admiral, one person is the captain, one person is the cook, some of us on the deck, scrubbing, cleaning, whatever it may be. We're all together. And that's why when you find that one day the people in the lower deck, they said, you know, we have to go all the way upstairs and we have to go and collect the water. Why don't we just drill a hole right here rather than disturbing them and just extract the water ourselves? And we all know what happens. They drown and everyone drowns. And if they're saved, everyone's saved. You are a reflection of us. That's what all Muslims are. So if you drown, we're drowning with you. Drowning with you because if sin and vice becomes a common practice, then even righteous people will be taken as well. And I was opposed to the Prophet Muhammad that will people be destroyed? <coughs> will people be destroyed? Yes, they will be destroyed. If Khabuf if filth and corruption becomes the normality, then even the righteous people will go with them. Righteous people will go with them, all of them will be taken together. So all of us, and some of us may be even asked on the Day of Judgment, so what steps did you take to help your community? What steps did you take to show them that this is the path of paradise? Obviously no one can take someone to paradise, but someone can help. We can all help each other to highlight that this is the path of paradise, because we've been told. أَلَمْ نَجْعَلْ لَهُ عَيْنَيْنْ وَلِسَانًا وَشَفَتَيْنْ وَهَدَيْنَا وَنَجْدَيْنْ Have we not given you two eyes? Have we not given you two lips? Have we not given you a tongue to express yourself? And likewise, have we not shown you the two paths? Just like with your eyes, you can begin to see obstacles and hardships and calamities and destruction. 
when your tongue, you can taste, in your mouth, you can taste something bitter, something sweet, something awful, something off. It's all there, isn't it? Then you can recognize it. And likewise, the two paths. The path of khair, the path towards Jannah, and the path towards Jahannam. But at that stage, what do we say? At that stage, we say, well, God told me to go on the path of evil. That's the path that Allah subhanahu wa made for me. I'm a bad person and God made it, I'm going to be bad. That's total foolishness that ulama has mentioned. Because right now, in this world, whilst you're living, if someone says to you right now, you switch on the radio, you switch on the television, and the M1 is blocked. And it says you take the M6 to return back to your location. Only a foolish man would then drive down the M1. Isn't it? You know you've been told clear cut every single channel, every single radio station, everyone you're talking to is alerted that the M1 is blocked. Do not go down that path. There's severe obstacles and snow, whatever it may be. Take the other path, take another route. Only a foolish man will go down that path. Do you go down that path and say, This is Qadr Allah? You don't do it in the dunya, do you? But when it comes to the akhirah, you travel on the wrong path of haram and say, This is Qadr Allah. This is Qadr of Allah, I'm doing haram, so I'm carrying on on the path. But you don't do it in the dunya. But you use an excuse that when you're living your life of evil. Remember, every single one of us <coughs> is this close to paradise as the shoelace on your right foot. That's how close every single one of us is to paradise. And every single one of us is as close to Jahannam as his left shoelace or in his left shoe. That's how close we are. And we've been given that choice. To try to take the path towards paradise and to rejoice in the bliss and the good things that we mentioned, to return back and to have that life of eternity. That is the real life of eternity, is the akhirah. How long are you going to live in this dunya for? That's why you find that in, when you return back to the akhirah and you find that a, a ram will be bought and people of Jahannam and people of paradise will recognize it. And even as a side point, if you go and study the ayat inside Surah Al-A'raf, deep ayat that you find talking about the ranks of the people in Jahannam and the people inside Jannah. And people in Jahannam ask them, throw down some food and drink upon us. Indeed, Allah has made it haram upon you to throw down something down upon you. But when that <coughs> ram comes, when that sheep comes, that animal comes, people of Jahannam will recognize it and people of paradise will recognize it. And when it's sacrificed, it will be said, Khuludun. Live in eternity in paradise, no death. And remember, in paradise, there's no death. There's no saliva. There's no urine. There's no defecation. There's no digesting of the food. The digesting of the food just becomes a burp of musk. That's what it becomes. There's no ghil, there's no rancor, there's no ill feeling. The hearts are all together. That's the return into paradise. The shape and the body, the image of human being becomes more beautified, becomes magnified. And then the, the opposite. For people of Jahannam, Khuludun Fala Mawt. Live for eternity. There's no death residing for eternity. Khalidina fiha abada. Eternity. Forever you're going to live inside Jahannam. Obviously, we know as Muslims, alhamdulillah, that whoever dies upon the kalima or had some concept of iman or Islam will eventually come back. But obviously, we don't want any of our people to be there. We don't want any Muslims because the Prophet Muhammad gave that parable as well. That my parable is like a person who ignites a fire in the hadith of Bukhari and stands there. You know that with fire, that the mosquitoes and the moth and etc., they come, insects come to the light. And he said that I'm trying to stop these insects and these mosquitoes and moths to come into the fire and preventing them. But they overcome and they go into the fire. That is the parable of I'm stopping people from going into Jahannam. But people are overcoming the process and going into Jahannam. So just like we began with it, you said, As a mercy, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْحَالَمِينَ Prophet has been sent as a mercy to the whole of mankind. And so obviously we want to spread that mercy, that you follow the path of mercy, 
then inshallah you'll have the path of paradise, you'll have goodness inside this world, and you'll return back to that rejoicing. And we fear for ourselves and for every single individual when we begin to follow the path of disobedience, the path of sins, the path of a wicked or a bad life, that could eventually, may Allah subhanahu wa forbid, all of us, any or any one of us, eventually going into Jahannam. That's what we want to avoid. And that was a message we want to deliver today, that the end of the soul, the end of the journey, will be one of these two maqamat, one of these two stations that one has to return back to. And we want to encourage that. We want to purify our soul, to become that pure soul. Ya ayyatuhal nafsul mutma'inna irji'i ila rabbiki rabiyatan mardiyya fadkhuli fi ibadi wadkhuli jannati. Oh, that content, good soul. Return back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Enter into amongst your, the, my servants, enter into my paradise. That's what we want. And you study the long hadith of Dara ibn Azab talking about the leaving of the soul of this world becomes a final journey. And we want the final journey, all of us, to be upon righteousness and consciousness and devotion towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وقول قولي هذا واستغفر الله لي ولكم ولجميع المسلمين فاستغفروه إنه الغفور الرحيم سبحانك وبحمدك شبه لا إله إلا أنت استغفرك وأتوب إليك بارك الله فيك